afternoon and welcome to Orkney Aviation Festival's closing session for today. If you wanted to choose an iconic image of Orkney, you might have a Primulus Scotica or an Oyster Catcher or the Old Man of Hoy. But since 1967, you also have the option of a small and robust aircraft in Loganair's red and white colours that every day carries passengers and freight between Kirkwall Airport and the North Isles. The Britain Norman Islander has been an integral part of Orkney life since 1967. It's also one of the best selling aircraft types produced in Europe. It's in demand around the world for its robustness and versatility. After being in production for close on 60 years, what does the future hold? Well, David Shaw, non-executive director of Britain Norman, is here with us to share the company's vision of the next generation Islanders. David, good afternoon. Welcome and good over afternoon. to you. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to present uh, this year's Orkney Aviation Festival. So the Orkney Islands, as we just heard, has a long history of operating the Britain Norman Islander. This evening, I'll offer a glimpse into the future as we prepare the Britain Norman Island to, to go green. So my name is David Shaw, and for the past 14 years, I've been the technical director at Britain Norman Aircraft. Uh, I'm a chartered engineer, a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and a member of the Institute of Directors. Over 40 years in the industry, uh, working uh, on very many different types of aircraft, from old Canberra aircraft to AH-101, the Merlin, to 777, Falcon 20s, Hawker Hunters, lots of different aircraft types, but of course, also the Britain Norman Islander. This evening, I'd just like to go through a little bit of uh, the history of the company, where we are today, uh, the different aircraft types and current production range, and then the latest innovations as we prepare to go green. The company derives its name from its founders, uh, John Britton, Desmond Norman, and in the early years, they're heavily involved with crop spraying. And over the time, they produced the Micronair sprayer, which is crop spraying equipment that goes under the wings of the aircraft. And in fact, uh, we've just converted uh, yet again another aircraft this past few months uh, to that crop uh, spraying uh, format. Uh, you'll see there as uh, Messrs. John Britton and Desmond Norman in front of the very first Islander. Britain Norman itself was formed in 1953, and the very first aircraft was a single engine monoplane, the Finney B. The Finney B aircraft is actually on display at the Solent Sky Museum in Southampton. The Britain Norman Islander was then born and first flew on the 13th of June, 1965. The, the picture there is for the very first aircraft being prepared for flight. And you'll see and you'll have noticed that not much has changed very much from the basic airframe design as we have today. And in fact, when I first joined uh, the company uh, 14, 15 years ago, I invited a company in to actually look at the aircraft and see what they can improve. I gave them a bag of money and asked them to go away for six weeks. And they came back and they said, well, we've looked at everything and uh, the wing is very, very good. It's optimally designed. The fuselage is excellent. The overall dynamics is perfect. They said, actually, there's not much we can change for the overall aircraft design. And a lot of people at the time thought it was a waste of money, uh, but I actually thought, no, it's good because now we won't waste any time trying to gain major improvements in the airframe itself. So we devoted our time and attention to other aspects of the aircraft design. William Hynett is now our chief executive, has been uh, for the past sort of 18, 20 years. And uh, like all companies now, we have our mission statement and it's a message from the, from the chief executive. And we have this sort of blend really of up-to-date specialist skills and knowledge, but also based on 60 years of experience in the aerospace industry. 
And people may, uh, on a call uh, tonight, or on a Zoom session tonight, may recall that William and his father, Morris, uh, came up to the Orkney Islands a couple of years ago in the Golden Aircraft, an Islander, but uh, I think people will have noticed as well a different engine sound. That was a turbine aircraft, not the more familiar piston aircraft. So Britain Norman is the only UK's aircraft is the RCA2 approved manufacturer. And what that means is we can build the whole aircraft. There's lots of other companies, quite a few large companies that build wings of aircraft in the UK, but we're the only one that actually builds the whole aircraft. And the longevity of the aircraft is based on its performance as a high capacity, multi-role, high frequency, rough terrain, short takeoff and landing platform. We obviously have all the capabilities as you'd expect for a, a aircraft manufacturer, and it is built on entrepreneurial innovation and specialists in trialing modifications. We have a full design capability uh, for CS23, so it's a small aircraft for Britain Norman size, but also we do larger aircraft as well. And one of the things we've introduced recently is a dedicated R&D department. This is filled with dedicated people that uh, can focus on the, the research and development for the future rather than being distracted with the day-to-day -day operational needs of running the business. We estimate around about 1,300 aircraft are built uh, and uh, around uh, the world um, and certified in 144 different countries. I'll go into a little bit more detail in a couple of slides time. I think one point to note as well is we're a private company uh, and the profits we generate are reinvested back into the company. Uh, this is a map of uh, where we are in the world, and uh, I'll just go through uh, some of the uh, various points on this slide. Uh, the BN sites are in the green sort of uh, dots with the sort of white stars, and we're very focused on the UK still. Uh, that's where we have our main offices. We have a, a headquarters in uh, London itself in St. James's Square. Uh, we have the design uh, people are mainly now based in Southampton in offices uh, near the train station, but also handy to get across to the Isle of Wight. Uh, we still have our facility in Bembridge, which is where it all started those many years ago, and that's more a manufacturing site. And also new hangars in Leon Solent, uh, this is the old Daedalus facility uh, between sort of Portsmouth and Southampton. Um, you can see there, you can probably just about work out, that's supposed to represent the island of Malta. And Malta, we have just taken on board a lease of a new hangar over there um, for training purposes. We, we feel that uh, with the UK weather, sometimes it's inclement, as we all know, and therefore there's better chance of training pilots in, in the Malta area. Uh, but that's becoming a, a little bit more of a hub as well. So we're looking at uh, putting uh, maintenance guys out there as well. And so things will develop, I'm sure, over the next year or two in that sort of arena. Just moving over to this Far East, um, we have uh, just a very small office in Hong Kong. Uh, and we're really just using that as a sort of foothold into that sort of arena, but also to uh, help with the time zones and support of the aircraft around the world. Moving across to the other side, um, we have a facility we've had there for some years now, over 20 years, in Miami. And it's ostensibly a sales office, but we also have in, uh, recently uh, extended the offices so that we can start to put a design team over there as well and, uh, and sort of help support that important market in the Caribbean and the USA. Uh, manufacturing, um, the manufacturing site there is actually uh, Budapest, Romania. We've had a long and fruitful uh, relationship with Romero over in Romania. And in fact, uh, the very first aircraft we used to fly out of Romania. Now we tend to, for economic reasons, no more than that, is to actually put the aircraft themselves, the wing and empennage is one, one truck, flat loader, and the uh, fuselage on a separate truck. And they all then wind their way through and ultimately to our Leon Solent facility where we put the aircraft back together and uh, we then do the final uh, testing and, and uh, approval. 
The red dots are actually where the aircraft is self-operating, and you can see that we pretty much cover the world. We don't uh, cover anything in Russia. I don't think anything's really going to change in that sort of aspect. But you can see the different varieties, obviously a lot in the islands. So it's very popular in the Caribbean, it's where the twin engine uh, um, actor, twin engine sort of features of the aircraft is very welcome in those crosswinds. Um, and you can also see that we're up in Alaska. So we cover the very, very cold environments. We cover also into the Himalayas in Nepal. So we cover the high environments as well. So it's a very versatile aircraft frame and we cover the world with our operations. These are the facilities at uh, Leon Solent, it's just the two new hangars. So the one on the left-hand side here, be in aviation, that's our 145 facility. So maintenance and modification centers. Uh, and these guys are just working at the moment on an aircraft for Logan Air to upgrade the autopilot. Uh, you see just about there, it's be an aircraft hangar, and that's the hangar we use to then uh, finalize the aircraft build and make sure it's uh, safe and sound and delivery to the customer. This slide uh, just highlights the fact I mentioned earlier that the, the aircraft design doesn't really change that much. Um, when we're doing design, we, everything stems still from the very first aircraft built. So the BN2A Islander. Uh, the 2B uh, is very, very similar. There's a few improvements from the design point of view, but not much. It looks very much the same sort of aircraft. And those aircraft are all piston engine aircraft. And um, the piston people are like coming from in America and are very reliable six cylinder engines uh, that we have on the island itself. And more familiar that you'll see, see and hear the sound of those light coming engines in, in the Orkneys. Uh, as we move on to the BN2T, it's similar airframe still. Uh, the only difference there is we put a turbine engine in. The turbine engines are from Rolls-Royce, originally Allison in, this, in the United States in Indianapolis. And then if you look at the next one is in the series is the four, Dash four, um, which just is very again similar, and it's a 4S that you actually notice as a stretch of the fuselage just after the wing. And that's just a slightly bigger size, but because of the bigger size in the fuselage, and we put a bigger engine in there, uh, it's still a Rolls Royce turbine, but it's a bigger engine. We need more authority on the rudder for a single engine out case, and therefore you can see there's a bigger fin and everything else. The Trilander um, is. The similar aircraft frame itself, but without obviously the engine in the tail. And that was developed uh, specifically for the route in Arini uh, in the Channel Islands from Southampton. Uh, also, you'll see some of these aircraft here with the bulbous nose. Uh, we've used the aircraft over the years for uh, trials purposes, and it's an ideal platform for doing that. And in fact, uh, when we uh, put this in the air fairly recently, um, one of the test pilots said it flies better than uh, most of the islands he's ever flown in. So the, the, the bulbous nose doesn't seem to make much difference to the flight characteristics of the aircraft. The current aircraft in production today uh, encompass the 2B-20, 2B-26, BN2T and the 2T-4. I've already mentioned that the 2Bs are the Lycoming engines. One has the 300 horsepower light coming engine. Uh, it's a fuel injected engine. Um, the 2B-26 is more familiar with, um, with Logan Air is a 260 horsepower, a normally aspirated engine. Very, very reliable uh, light coming engines, piston engines. Uh, B2, uh, BN2T is the first I said before, where you start to put the 320 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine in. On the 4S, we actually put a 400 horsepower engine in, in the Rolls-Royce uh, uh, Rolls -Royce, Rolls -Royce aircraft, uh, BN2T4S. Uh, you can see with the maximum takeoff weights there as well, as we get more thrust, we start to be able to actually uh, get a bit more takeoff weight. And that's one of the driving forces we've had over the years to, to do that. Um, everybody seems to want more. Uh, we want more takeoff weight. So in a lot of areas, we need to get increased thrust. Having discovered that um, the aircraft itself was optimally designed, 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, then we looked about improving the areas we could improve and it was worthwhile doing so. So just as a comparison, uh, we'll look here at uh, sort of a, an older sort of aircraft cockpit layout. It's, it's fairly basic, uh, a lot of analog instruments, uh, all perfectly safe and sound and operational. Uh, on this aircraft particularly, it's got a second uh, a co-pilot's uh, control column and, and, and functions. A lot of the airlines operators have possibly one in their fleet uh, because they use that aircraft then for uh, pilot training purposes. So we do have uh, that capability on all aircraft platforms. You can have a second uh, pilot's position in there. But over the years, uh, it's like a lot of things, uh, things have moved away from the analog side of the world to the digital side. And um, just to go through a couple of slides on that in, in now, one of these, I've just highlighted a couple that we're recently embodying, uh, the engine instruments. So instead of the old analog instruments we saw before, uh, we now uh, offer a couple of different variations on engine instruments, uh, which incorporates also the fuel systems uh, with the quantity and uh, things like that. So this one is an instrument we've been operating and using for quite some time, probably about five or six years now at JP Instruments uh, based in the States. Uh, but Garmin are doing more and more uh, items for the aircraft of this sort of uh, level uh, and the GA market itself. And so we've actually just started to introduce the Garmin uh, engine instruments uh, for the piston engines. Uh, we're currently working with Garmin themselves to introduce it for the turbine aircraft as well. And you can see now is a, a cockpit of a recently delivered aircraft, uh, which has got all the uh, digital equipment as you can uh, envisage. Uh, this is the Garmin G600 TXI system. So for the primary front flight display, this has got the JP Instruments uh, flight engine instruments there. We've got a, a multifunction display in this side of, as well. And then also the customer's chosen to put another Garmin display so you can have secondary information there for the pilot on the right-hand side of the co-pilot. Uh, you'll notice that they still retained uh, the analog instruments for standby purposes. Now that's a customer choice. Um, and we do offer though a fully uh, uh, standby system, a uh, digital standby system uh, for this operation as well. But it just shows you the way the, the world has moved uh, and that uh, now it just cleans up the cockpit panel area itself. But also one of the key things is that it, it actually is easier then to introduce more benefits and features as they become available, as new safety features will be designed and implemented. So it becomes easier to actually add anything from a digital format into this aircraft once it's transformed into a digital aircraft. So I've talked about the past uh, and the current state of the company products, but what about the future? Where, where are we heading for the future? But Britain Norman is looking to really sort of push ahead with this sort of green and energy efficient future. Just give you a moment to read that slide. So the next generation in Islander will be a clean energy solution, but still retaining the features of the Islander integral to the success, such as affordability and dependability. Britain Norman understands that it has a responsibility to invest in the future of aviation and is undertaking a range of initiatives to achieve its zero carbon goal. And we'll share the, some of those in a moment. The Islander is ideally suited to future development of the aircraft and also for the green initiatives because it is easily modified. It is a very basic airframe, which is part of its strengths. 
but as well from a safety point of view it has that two engines a twin engine so often we can put a an unknown engine on one side of the aircraft but retain a known uh, engine on the right hand side say and so if we do get any difficulties while we're doing the flight test phases uh, it's going to be okay and safe One of the ways we're looking at improving things as a sort of interim measure as we move towards a sort of green environment is to look what we can do to existing aircraft engines. This one here is actually a schematic of a Lycoming engine. Um, so it's the same basic airframe, basic engine we use on all the islanders at the moment. Uh, and that gives us some confidence because we know it's very reliable and works. But the main difference here is we're putting a turbocharger on it and also electronic control. Um, so this gives then the, the possibility to actually uh, increase the fuel efficiency. And it's a bit like a modern car. Uh, when you have the carburetors and everything else, they're not as fuel efficient as they can be made once you start to put the electronics and the software into the system. So we're actually, at the moment, we have a, a mock-up of this aircraft engine uh, in Bembridge under the wing, and we're actually just working uh, through that with Lycoming, uh, and we're looking to do a first flight on this engine sometime next year. One of the other uh, uh, projects we're involved in is something called Project HEART. Um, and HEART stands for, we can just about read it under there, I think, is the hydrogen, electric, and automated regional transportation. So the aims of the project is to have uh, and develop a hydrogen powered aircraft, but also automated with remote piloting solution, carrying nine to 19 passengers, nine to 19 passengers to take short up journeys of under 500 nautical miles. And we're looking to use then the airfields that are dotted around the country still. A lot of them were, were there and used uh, for World War II purposes, but still are there and using those sort of local airports to facilitate this uh, transformation on, on uh, regional transport. The organizations include uh, Blue Bear for the automation. And we're working closely with those guys at the moment. Um, and Inmasat, Inmasat for the satellite links. But obviously, Britain Norman have, tried, have also teamed with the Highlands and Islands Airport and uh, Logan Air as well. As I said earlier, we will work with Blue Bear Systems to automate the Islander. And that's sort of fairly straightforward. There's quite a bit of work to do. But in essence, the autopilots are a form of automation already. So it builds upon the autopilots that are already installed in the aircraft. Uh, and the trials we're hoping will start uh, in the new year. Project HARD includes the hydrogen fuel cells to uh, power the aircraft itself. And uh, I understand that Logan Air and Highland Island Airport Facility will lead on the accommodation of the automation hydrogen fuel aircraft operations. Uh, the UK government uh, is involved in, in uh, setting up quite a few initiatives on, on trying to incentivize companies like ourselves and Logan Air to move towards a future uh, of zero carbon. Um, and this is making you know, a big difference to people. And we do find that the aircraft, as I said before, is ideally suited to help push forward, not only our own aircraft platform, but also to develop these fuel systems and aircraft platform systems for the future. Uh, there's a lot of work going on at the moment um, for hydrogen uh, fuel uh, for the aircraft itself. And the reasons you know, why we're using hydrogen is sort of spelt out there in that it is abundant, the supply is virtually limitless, um, but uh, we've got to be careful. We don't uh, assume that everything we do with hydrogen is green. Uh, there's various different types of hydrogen um, 
and it, it's got a designation of different colors from green, blue, gray, brown, pink, turquoise, yellow, white. And basically the colors designate how green the hydrogen is and how it's manufactured. So for example, green hydrogen is one produced with no harmful greenhouse gas emissions. It's used by using clean electricity from surplus renewable energy sources, such as solar wind power, to electrolyze, electrolyze the water and turn it into hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is mainly from natural gas, uh, by, used by a process called steam reforming. So there are different types of hydrogen. Uh, so uh, like I said, we need to be assume, not to assume that every time we mention hydrogen, it's gonna be as green as possible. But our role in the project is to work with the hydrogen uh, fuel delivery and ensure then we can feed that into the engines and, and uh, transform that into flight. Uh, you'll see on the picture here, it's ideal platform, the Islander, because underneath the wing, there are actually two hard points, two each, uh, four hard points to each side, and where we can uh, put under wing tanks. This one here is just a stylized uh, uh, picture, which includes the hydrogen tanks there. These aircraft have already fitted successfully and flown many hours with underwing fuel tanks of kerosene. Another project uh, we're working with is Project Fresson. Um, and um, the Orkney Islands, I understand, already have wind turbines. And in Cork Kirkwall Harbour, the inter-island ferries can already be powered by locally produced hydrogen via fuel cells. So Project Freston is going to be using hydrogen fuel cells with wing-mounted fuel tanks, as I said before. And I understand you're having a discussion tomorrow with Richard Freston, son of Ted Freston, uh, the founder of Highland Airways, which is where we've taken the name for Project Freston. The first flight of a Freston aircraft is planned for 2022, next year. So the next generation Islander, what's it gonna look like? Well, it's a new aircraft type, but you'll look at it and really see that it's very, very similar because there's very difficult to change this, this design. It's really well designed from the early days from Britain and Norman. We are looking to increase the maximum takeoff weight and range uh, because we do find that over the years, people have grown a bit bigger and in some uh, parts of the world, they do actually weigh the passengers before they get on the aircraft. So what we want to do is ensure that we can go back to our original basis, which was nine people and their suitcases in the Islander. Uh, so we will look at increasing the maximum takeoff and range, but also maintain the unique selling points of the aircraft itself. So short takeoff and landing criteria and its versatility. Um, Heaven forbid, people who have been in the island will know that uh, they're not the sort of uh, quietest aircraft on the planet, uh, but we will look to see where we can look at noise reduction and anything to do with the sort of electric engines will obviously help in that uh, area, but also to see what else we can do from um, in interior as well to reduce that uh, noise signature and the passenger comfort. And of course, we're all aiming for that zero carbon capture. So presentation to this evening is just giving you a little bit of an insight into what we're looking at at Britain Norman. Um, and really because of the platform itself, uh, it, we're in a unique position where we can really help push these items and ideas uh, that are around the world to really develop the zero carbon capture and help the Islander go green. So thank you for listening. And I believe there's time for some questions. Yes, and you've stimulated quite a number of them. In fact, somebody remembers seeing a Briton Norman Islander in a, a James Bond movie, and they're wondering how that came about. Um, yes, so we, we actually weren't involved um, with that, but uh, while well, I do understand they, they took about three different air air aircraft platforms, and the people who've seen the film, it is quite spectacular. And um, 
of course, we were a little bit concerned as because part of the movie at the end, that the wings fall off and everything falls off. But what we can say is James Bond got out alive. So the aircraft is very robust. Uh, there is a, a little bit of a story after that in that um, we had a, a 50th anniversary party down at Leon Solent, and we had some aircraft flying in and everything else. And we painted an old aircraft uh, platform in the black colours, the same as in the movie, and put a 007 transfer on the side, and everybody had sort of pictures taken by it and didn't really think too much of it. About a week later, we, we get a, uh, a writ from Sony to say they're going to sue us if we don't stop uh, putting images around <laughs> of that aircraft. And uh, so uh, needless to say, we, we, we settled out of court with those guys that are a little bit bigger than us, the Sony Corporation. But uh, that was a, quite a, a funny uh, aside to that uh, movie. <laughs> and there's another question. Um, someone who's very impressed by the, the digital format in your cockpits, and they're wondering, suppose um, a, a Logan Air pilot had fallen into a, a deep sleep in, say, 1977 and woke up today, how would they actually find it flying an islander? Would they very rapidly do it? Would it take a little bit of familiarization? I think it would take a little bit of familiarization. I mean, the basic instruments themselves, it, it is the same, some, the artificial horizon and things like that. So there's an altitude reading. So nothing's really changed from that format. Um, the flying controls are the same. Um, but it just does, once they do get used to it, it just gives them a little bit better situational awareness. Yeah. And so we do find that once uh, the pilots do fly in these aircraft with the digital cockpit, they don't want to go back. Now, there are so many uses of the aircraft, and I just wondered if you could outline some of some of the examples of the, the versatility of the aircraft and the ingenuity of people in finding a use for it. Yes, uh, I mean, they, they all started, as we said, with the crop spraying. And in, in fact, we're, we're just finishing this aircraft for the crop spraying today. And we use that around the world. Uh, they're used in, um, in um, Louisiana uh, for mosquito control. Uh, same sort of concept. So that early concept of spray uh, crop spraying is, is, is taken off and is still flying around the world. Um, the passenger aircraft, obviously, is the mainframe. Uh, but also, and you'll be familiar with the Orkney Islands with the Medivac purpose, uh, because that can really become a lifeline for islands like the Orkneys and other islands around the world. Uh, because if there is a medical emergency, it may be your only way to get people out in a, in a, in a reasonable time frame. Um, also, um, in this world we live in nowadays, unfortunately, we do use our aircraft for surveillance purposes. So you will see some fancy cameras on the front and other equipment that probably can't go through today. But basically, they're used for surveillance purposes. The aircraft itself is, once it's high in the air, it's very unobtrusive for surveillance compared to, say, a helicopter. If it was a helicopter near you, you know about it. Whereas our islander can be actually quite high up. Uh, all our aircraft are cleared to 25,000 feet uh, ceiling. Now, obviously, once you get past sort of 10, 12,000 feet, you need some sort of oxygen system, but that, that can be done. Uh, so there's those, those um, aspects as well. So it is a very versatile platform. Um, we do use it for a lot of trials, and you saw that big nose uh, sort of air, aircraft uh, variant. And that was used for trialing some radars for the Ministry of Defence some years back uh, and everything else. So we do find uh, that we are doing a lot of trials work uh, because, again, the versatility it can be modified fairly straightforwardly uh, and we can put things in the air quite quickly. Would you say that one of its strengths is that it's so much designed for the benefit of the user? Yeah, I, I think that's true. They're, they're, they're very easily uh, easy to maintain. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes what we find is the technicians uh, that are coming through now, the new guys, sometimes struggle because they're used to the more modern aircraft 
where uh, they everything is is by rote and they've got to follow the instructions and everything else. Whereas the Islander was developed to be you know in the middle of nowhere and, and still be maintained. And uh, so what that means is is uh, we use a lot of on condition maintenance. So uh, that's designed primarily to give versatility to different operators around the world. So we know uh, an operator in Germany that was flying to the Frisian Islands that they know within the second almost of when their brakes need to be changed. Now we don't enforce to say your brakes need to be changed after 20, you know, 100 flying hours. We say on condition. And then it's up to the operator to develop that. Whereas the modern aircraft will give you a prescribed time and everything else to go with that. So it is, it's one of the versatilities of it, but we, we do find that we have to almost retrain some of the technicians to get used to this on condition uh, way of working. And do you find that the, the market is continuing to be there? There are continuing to be new customers with, with direct uses who are very, very keen to get an Islander? There is. Uh, I mean, the, we have two aspects of the business, really, in terms of uh, aircraft. And one is new build. And we try to do a handful of aircraft a year. Um, and um, but mostly we actually refurbish uh, older aircraft. So we're taking older aircraft, uh, we give them a clean bill of health and we make them put the modern cockpit in or put scrape, uh, spray crop in, systems in or whatever the customer wants. And um, we find that that is actually uh, quite a large part of our business model is refurbishment of old aircraft. Um, the, the aircraft strength is that it goes on forever. Uh, we've, we've recently been repairing an aircraft, I think it was number 35 on the line. Uh, so that's still flying. Um, but the weakness is it goes on forever. You know, we, we'd like it to be a little bit like your washing machine. If you've got your washing machine with a five-year guarantee, you know 5.5 years time it's going to fail. Um, whereas you know, we haven't built that into the aircraft. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's, so it goes on forever, believe me. Do you find with work like that, like refurbishment, that your workforce is very much almost like a craft industry, very, very proud of their, te of their techniques and just good with their hands? I think that's exactly right. Um, and and it, it's, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. We, we find that, um, you know, certain people come into the company from a design background or a maintenance background or manufacturing background. And it's difficult sometimes to work out if they will stay. Uh, we can bring in two, two people from, say, I'll just use Kinetic as a, as a firm. I can bring in two people from that firm. And in fact, one is now stayed with us and now the current technical director took over from me. And another guy came in, started similar time and went back to Kinetic after two years. So it's not for everybody, uh, but you're right. It does, it's more a craftsman's type uh, business. Uh, and if you really get into that, it's very fruitful and fulfilling career. And how do you find the, the source of skilled people? Do you find it fairly easy to get them or do you have to look quite carefully? You have to look quite careful, but part of that is just sort of a UK shortage of engineers, uh, and it's almost a worldwide shortage now. So there is specifically a, um, a shortage, uh, and I think it's happened where we've got a gap of about 20 years of people following behind me. So the old guys like me are retiring at some point, and there's a gap of about 20 years. Thankfully, they seem to be coming through. Uh, the system now, the war is engineering through uh, the universities, but there was a time where they were almost discouraged. In fact, I've, I've got two sons myself, and one's gone to the dark side and gone to finance and accountancy, but one's actually chose, chosen the right path and is doing engineering at the university. So uh, I managed to get one back into the system. Indeed, was there a time that people were going into the more theoretical things, the more white collar things, and there was a, a slight attitude to engineering that it, maybe even looking down on something that was a bit practical and, and, and useful. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's still the case to, to a large extent. I, I think that 
we don't help ourselves in that uh you know we 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 everybody talks about an engineer so the, the, our initial thought in the uk is that that's the guy who's got to fix your washing machine now, of course that's not in in the correct parlance it's that's a technician yeah the engineers are behind the scenes creating the instructions doing the design work and everything else so we don't help ourselves sometimes the press doesn't help ourselves uh, sort of promote the engineers where if you go to say germany uh, they're a lot more respected uh, and also the states i've spent a lot of time working in the states over in seattle with Boeing and people like that and then they have a, a different way of working they have a professional uh, career ladder for dedicated engineers and a managerial career ladder and, and you know there's no p- penalty either way you know they want good people to be the best they can and the company, uh, it, it was impressive to see the various locations that you're opening offices in Malta, in Europe, and then out in Asia. Where do you see the big potential markets for the future? Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to say in that um, we are a worldwide company. We're, we're very, very small but we operate on a worldwide footprint. And we've got to be careful we don't overextend ourselves, but it's important that we do get out into these different places. For example, we've just uh, obtained an order uh, recently for the Seychelles. So obviously we're all desperately trying to work out a reason to uh, fly down to the Seychelles to help with that order. But, you know, it it is a worldwide business. The last aircraft we delivered uh, new, brand new, was for the Falcon Islands. Um, so it's it's everywhere around the world, and that that market is still there. And, and what we do find is there's certain companies that once the aircraft do get to about 15, 20 years old, will want to put a new one in the system. So they do that, but then we will normally take their refurbished uh, their aircraft off their hands, their old aircraft, and refurbish it and put it back into the marketplace. So there is a sort of a virtuous circle that goes on, but. The marketplace, I think, has has been helped by the presentation I've just given, really, in that it's a very suitable platform to help um, industry really develop the green credentials with the different power sources, electric engines and everything else that goes with that. So uh, it, it's it's we've certainly seen a sort of Philip the past sort of uh, six months, 12 months on, on the people actually wanting to talk to us and where we can move forward with the platform. There's several interesting questions come in about that. And in the meantime, one's come from Ian Hutchison, who, an interesting one, who he's, he says, the Islander and the reason for its success in Orkney when island airstrips were less sophisticated than today has caused it to be referred to as, quote, an aerial tractor. He says, or he asks, is Britain Norman flattered or bemused or what? By this and similar descriptions, what Ian asks is in the BN publicity brochures. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a tricky one, but uh, we we sort of internally know is the the, the the defender of the skies. So it's the Land Rover defender of the skies, and it is that because it's not very pretty. Yeah, let's be honest, it's it's you know, a bit agricultural sometimes, but. It's just like the Defender, the Land Rover Defender itself. You can maintain it in the middle of the jungle. You can keep it running and it'll, it'll serve you well and it'll get you out of some tricky situations. So we do, we do recognize that it, there are some sort of features that are not very well developed, but it's a very dependable aircraft. I think that you know, you've got your own experience in the Orkneys. Once you get used to the quirkiness of it and, and everything else and the noise of it, you, you tend to love it because it is a reliable platform and will do what you want it to do. One of the green questions that comes in is, is the question of the different modes of transport. There's road and there's rail and, and air and regional mm. airlines. Do you think there's a, a kind of competition between them? And in which case it may be that whichever one goes greener faster is going going to benefit yeah it's it's a tricky question um and but i I think we'll still want all different types of transport i think people will still want to have some sort of flexibility in their own cars or automated cars or whatever it's going to be Uh, people just don't want to fly sometimes and therefore if we do get 
the new train systems up and running, then people prefer train. But there are people that will just want the convenience of flying and just uh, the short hops or longer hops or whatever. So I, I don't see the demise of aviation quite yet, is my answer. And I guess aviation also offers, offers the opportunity to sometimes cut across existing routes. So if a, a rail route is to a, been between two particular areas, well, a regional one, particularly a small aircraft, can give better options. Yes, yes. And, and I think that um, if you look at uh, the rail network, say in the UK, we've had that recent incident I'm aware of where a, a, a Tesco's lorry went into the bridge in the southwest. And so that's cut off the whole of Cornwall for a week. Now, that's sort of um, unless they start to develop the rail networks into that extent where there is redundancy built in, there will be a, a reason for aircraft to be able to fly down and support these areas. So, yeah. A question that came up in the, the previous talk when, we, when we, we spoke to Logan Air was the extent to which they're finding that everyone wants to make things happen when it comes to going green, whether it's government, department, yeah. private sector. Yeah. Are you finding the same? Uh, we are, but of course, it's like a lot of these things in, in that um, it, it's, it's the frontier of, of development. And what I mean by that is if we are designing a, a new aircraft today with existing power plants, so a turbine engine, a piston engine, whatever, then we have a design code that we must meet from the authorities. Now, the design code for electric engines and hydrogen propulsion hasn't been written yet. So we're at the forefront now of that industry where part of the work we will be doing will be developing these uh, requirements uh, in, in concert with the authorities. And some of the things we, we design in and decide upon today may not be the same things that we design and work with in two years time. And that's where we are as an industry now, we are pushing the boundaries uh, of where we need to get to, to ensure that the aircraft we do produce are, are safe and sound. And with hydrogen technology, <laughs> there's been a, a big development, a big a lot of discussion about it in recent months even. To what extent now is it clear that hydrogen is the road ahead for, for transport? I, I think it's, it's overtaken batteries, even in the just past sort of six months, in that uh, we were originally looking at aircraft to be using batteries as a power propulsion, if, if not as a hybrid, but the battery technology is still behind where it needs to be for aircraft in the fact that it's not light enough. The batteries are not light enough for the power and energy we require, whereas the hydrogen is, yeah? Hydrogen is very fuel efficient, but of course you need a little bit more to um, actually be able to you know, get the same power output, hence the aircraft itself using those sort of window wing tanks. And, and again, it just shows you the, the versatility of the aircraft and it's those hard points. And the hard points have been used over the years for many different things, from fuel tanks to actually dropping sea skewer torpedoes, believe it or not. And so those hard points now are, are, are proving a, a godsend in the design from the early days. Uh, and therefore, if you want to put the fuel tanks under the wing, like we showed on that stylized picture, then the aircraft can do it. There would have to be now, presumably, a really big push nationally to make supplies of hydrogen available. Can this be a bit like the chicken and the egg? You know, you, you need the aircraft to encourage the hydrogen investment, but of course the, the people who fly need the source. It is, and there's a little bit what I said before about the different types of hydrogen as well. You know, you need to create hydrogen. Yeah, so you're going to be doing using it from a solar-powered basis but you know the recent reports of past uh, week has said that there wasn't the solar power to actually uh, produce the electricity we need for the uk never mind creating hydrogen so they had to fire up the uh, the old coal-fired power stations for a little while this week <clears throat> so there's going to be that ongoing debate but i think that's more a debate of uh, the uk's uh, strategy for electricity and that's a whole different debate you, I'll, I'll come back and do a whole section on what my thoughts are for the uk strategy for electricity but it, it is a bit of that chicken and egg and, and the government has a role to play in in creating that infrastructure and environment to 
ensure that the electricity is going to be there in sufficient sort of amounts to actually do what we need to do. The All the experts on climate change are saying it's very urgent now, actions needed. Do you think, is it possible for the aviation industry to respond in the, the quite short time frame needed? Um, I, I think it is. I think it's moving, moving quickly all the time. And uh, again, another feature of the aircraft, another aircraft around the world, is that it is easy to modify. Yeah. So, uh, and with our credentials as well, we, we have the full flight test capability. So with one um, stroke of the pen, we can perform a flight test without anybody's holding our hands once we've satisfied ourselves we're safe and sound. So the actual development process can be quite swift. And I think the, the issue is going to be is the authorities sort of keeping up with us, but they are, they are actually working on these things as well in parallel. In fact, could this then be a situation, I guess, then where the people building the really large, the massive airliners are going to have quite a challenge because the scale of what they have to do is so big, where a smaller aircraft have actually got an advantage? Yes, exactly. And I think that goes back to your question earlier in that uh, the sort of use of the island and other aircraft of this type it has been a little bit of a fillip where people are not going to get on the jumbo jets and the triple sevens the same way as they used to. And therefore they are going to be looking at different ways of flying and more localized. So yes, absolutely. And one general question to round off, looking at the future, there are so many challenges in the world today. So many challenge challenges for any company. Do you feel cautious or is there some optimism? Um, optimistic, I think that um, the the thing that will hold us back is one of your questions before uh, earlier as well, Harry, was uh, about the engineers. Yeah, we, we do need engineers, and you know that's that's one thing that part of my new role is, is to go around and work with companies and work with the universities. Uh, we've we've got a, a good relationship with. Uh, uh, Hertfordshire University uh, over, over in Hatfield. Uh, I'm doing a presentation to Imperial College in a few weeks' time as well. So it's really trying to get the message out that the industry is, is a really sort of good industry uh, to be in and interesting to work in uh, and encourage more engineers to come our way. I think that's one of the, going to be one of the, the problems we, we're facing and are facing. But overall, I'm optimistic. Absolutely fascinating. It's been a pleasure to listen, uh, David, and we wish you warmly success in the future. Our thanks to you, our thanks to, to the technical team behind the scenes, our thanks to everyone viewing and everyone sending in such interesting questions. We will be back tomorrow with more from the Aviation Festival, when at two o'clock we look at another highly successful aircraft, this time from yesteryear, the de Havilland Dragon Rapide. Well, that's tomorrow, but in the meantime, our thanks again to David, our thanks to everyone, and goodbye for now. Thanks very much.